to the soccer shocker that's rocked the beautiful game. The match-fixing allegations made by Europol in its investigation have really, really shocked the sporting fraternity. And the man at the centre of it all, the man who ran this organised betting racket, Wilson Raj Perumal, has been caught. What will he reveal? Eastern European town, nothing happens here. Sleepy, thinly populated streets that come alive only on weekends before games of a local team. But this has no interest for us. We are here to meet the most notorious person from the world of bets and match fixing. He was arrested in 2011 in Finland and gave up everyone people, schemes, and whole football federations. Investigators were shocked by volumes of money he's been dealing with. Once he rented a stadium, bribed 22 players and referees, bought equipment and announced through newspapers about fast food chain's final game. People came to the game and made bets, but he manipulated the teams like in a video game. Now he lives here under witness security program. So meet Wilson Raj Perumal. After release from prison, you returned back to old business. Why? Uh, well, if you already you have this uh, skill, you only have this skill. You know, academic qualifications. You go and find a job, and if you have a criminal history, it's not easy to get a job. So you always go back to, I mean, uh, any kind of criminals. Uh, uh, from from my culture, Singapore, is that. Uh, Somebody who is involved in burglary, when he's released from prison, a couple of months later, they have a tendency to go back to burglary. So if you are a drug trafficker, you go back to drug trafficker. So it is, uh, it is like uh, if you have no skill, you know other skills to make money. But you need to make money to survive. So what do you do? There is a legend that you lost three million dollars for one night in Amsterdam. Uh, yes, yes, yes. I was there to fix this match, uh, uh, Willem II versus Feyenoord, if I'm not wrong, okay, and uh, I don't know, the, I, I just can't understand that game at all, because Dutch football is about goals, you know, so uh, there was a first goal, and after that, and it was so cold that I, could, I couldn't stand in the stadium, that I have to practically just move myself, jump and keep myself warm, so, and the match ended 1-0, and I lost probably about 800,000 Singapore dollars in that match, and I went back to my hotel room and I went a little berserk with my gambling and in total I think I lost three million dollars on one, one night, uh, two nights I can say, Friday night, Saturday night, Friday, sorry, uh, Saturday night and Sunday night, just in Amsterdam. You had millions of dollars in hand, why haven't you quit match fixing for a legal business? Uh, well, <laughs> I, I don't have this uh, business knowledge that uh, I could really start up with, but I, I was more addictive to gambling, you know, not that I don't know uh, the, 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 the way to make money, but uh, sometimes I talk to myself, I said, hey, look, you have a couple of million dollars, but you're not happy, why are you not happy? You know, you talk to yourself, it's because I'm losing on my website, on the normal gambling, so I'm not happy. So my inner voice tells me, how many people have a couple of million dollars and they are not happy? You know? So you must be happy, so you are a sportsman, you're not a gambler. But as soon as I go back, I see some games on the TV and then I sit before my computer and start betting again. So it's like the devil takes over you. But you know that uh, with $5 million, I know that I can buy five properties in Singapore, one, 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 one. And then I can mortgage them and take $2.5 million to continue to run my business. And I can still uh, lease out this and uh, pay the mortgage loan. You know? But 15 years later, these properties belong to me and I don't pay a cent because the, the, the leases are people who pay. So I know this, but I didn't execute this. You know? So you can call it pure stupidity, 
or whatever you want to. What's the biggest win in your career? In batting, match fixing or in casino? I can recall the biggest, two biggest loss of, but I cannot recall me winning that big money. But I think uh, my biggest win was, uh, uh, <coughs> was uh, Morocco versus Malaysia. It was a uh, normal gambling. Uh, World Youth Cup in 97, that was about uh, 600,000 Singapore dollars, a single wager, and I won that match because of, um, actually that match was fixed in order for Morocco was, was supposed to just win the match by 1-0 against Malaysia. And uh, uh, even the bookie who, who accepted my bet, he, he advised me that, look, there is somebody who is collecting the bets on Morocco's favour very strongly. And you can watch the match that Morocco was way above Malaysia and they were just playing for one goal win. And eventually one reserve player came onto the pitch sometime 87 or 88 and he scored the winning goal. And that goal, uh, the score eventually became 3-1. I think 3-1 or 2-0, I, I cannot recall, but I won that match. Uh, the loss was, I think, um, World Cup 2010, Spain versus Honduras. David Villa, I, I, my odds was 2, 2.5. I, I think that was the biggest bet I ever play, uh, wagered. It's about 800,000 euro for Spain to win by 3-0. If Spain wins by 2 nil or less, I lose. So David Villa misses a penalty after the score is 2 nil. If it's 3 nil, I would have won 1.2 million. Do you remember the game Barcelona-Paris Saint-Germain when the Catalonians lost 4-0 in Paris and won in the second leg 6-1 at Camp Nou? Was it a clean match? I think uh, if we're talking about this game, I, I, I don't know because uh, usually football, if it's a corrupt match or not, is not based on the result. It's based on the movement of the odds. You, Brazil can lose 8-0 to uh, Germany in, in Rio. But it is not the result, it is the movement of the odds, how it fluctuates, whether it plunges, and then that is the evidence you know, that can eventually uh, give you a detailed picture of whether the match is fixed or not, the movement of the odds, not the result. I would say that one match that was practically uh, not right and everybody turned a blind eye was uh, Chelsea versus Barcelona. Champions League, it's yes, semi-final. Semi -final. That's, that's absolutely ridiculous. It's not football. Somebody killed that football. I mean, people say, I kill football, I, I destroy football. But someone destroyed football at this level. I, I don't destroy football at this level, but maybe at a much lower level, where the, the, uh, where the, uh, where the what you can say, the spectators are not uh, a very small group of spectators, you know, this kind of matches. But this is an internationally watched match, I mean, with billions of viewers and uh, right under the nose, a, a blatant penalty. I, I can forgive the referee for everything, but not the blatant penalty. Gerard Piquet steps the ball, and you don't give a penalty for that. There's something not right, and there's everything is hush hush. Nobody talks about it. And Zenit Zenit, Zenit Saint Petersburg beats Bayern Munich 5-0 in a UEFA Cup final, if I'm not drunk a couple of years back. And I think someone said that we paid this much of money to win the Cup also. But everything went hush-hush. No, no, no ban on Bayern Munich, nothing whatsoever. Yeah, I don't see Bayern Munich losing 5-0 to any team, you know, any team in the world. Bayern cannot lose 5-0. But I remember this game very vividly because Bayern was 2-0 down, I put money on Bayern to score the next goal, 3 nil. And I continue to put the money again on Bayern because Bayern is not a team that can lose 5 nil to Zenit St. Petersburg or any other team in, 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 at any level. So that was a ridiculous result. In the beginning of the 90s, Lokomotiv Moscow were invited to Asia for a Milan Cup. Have you worked with Russian players? If yes, tell their names. When Lokomotiv Moscow was playing Thailand, the first game, the whole punters, the bookies, where we gather in the stadium I was talking about, they all knew that the result is going to be nil-nil, which means the locomotive is not going to win. They were favourites. And the result eventually finished 0-0. Zero -zero. And locomotive was playing, if I'm not wrong, China on the, uh, uh, on the semi, in the semi-final. I cannot recall exactly who, is, who was their opponent, but they lost the game 3-1. 
and during the halfway, a half time, I was at the stadium, there were some reserve players and I looked at them and I showed them his money and they were smiling. You know? So the result was 3-1. So locomotive came there to fix, make money and go back. So this is something that I learned that if you can fly a team that can give you a full cooperation, dance to your tune and that's where the money lies. And then I took this cue and then I used it when, Zim when I brought Zimbabwe to play in the Merdeka Cup. One day you decided to make a step forward and attempted to bribe Birmingham's goalkeeper Iron Bennett. What was the story? I, I, you know, the culture is different in England. So in Singapore, you can just approach somebody at a time, and you can use someone's name, the person knows, and then you break the ice and then you can approach. But uh, in, in England, the culture was different. So when I approached this player, what he said was, he, I could see that Englishmen don't take bribery that easily when it comes to football. They love the game, they have passion, they have pride. So he just turned down, he's not interested. And we left the, the area, Birmingham City, if I'm not wrong. We were in Birmingham at the time. Right after it, you made another attempt in EPL. Now with Russian goalkeeper from Chelsea, Dmitry Karin. Went to Chelsea with the training ground, but not with the intention to bribe Karin, but to just check out and all and so on. So, but uh, after uh, we realized, I realized that the the, 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 the atmosphere is quite tense. It's not so easily to approach a player and talk. It doesn't work that way. So what happened, we were trying to get a lift hitchhike to, to the nearest bus station. And uh, Karin happened to drive with a Mini, a Mini Cooper, if I'm not wrong. So we sat, I was sat, I, I sat in the front and one of my friends was seated at the back. So I approached him, I spoke to him, I said, look, we can give you 100,000 US dollars. And we had 100,000 US dollars in our hands at the time, so we offered that. But he was okay guy, <laughs> he said, look, I don't do this. I have a very long contract with Chelsea. I have no intention of doing this. And I had previously in the 94 World Cup, I also had offers people coming to me, they can do this. But I'm not this sort of person. So he was a gentleman. So he dropped us and we left. We left the scene as quickly as possible before he could call somebody or report that we want to do something negative. So we left the scene and that was it. Was it your idea to bribe stadium electricians to turn off floodlights during matches? So something crossed me that, uh, you know, in the football law at that time, that if the second half were to begin, even for five seconds, the referee blows the whistle for the second half and starts for five minutes or even five seconds and then due to uh, uh, natural circle, uh, I mean uh, disaster or lightning or thunder, if the game is called off, that result counts, that result stays, even though the second half is just for five seconds or five minutes or ten minutes, the result stays. So if we switch off the lights, I, 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 I put this proposal to my boss. At that time, he was Rajendran Kurusam. They put this proposal, why don't we hire the electrician to switch off the lights in the stadium? And that idea just went into the cold. You know, nobody suggested. Then one fine day, I was with Dan Tan. We were talking about it. Hey, you know this game, Galatasaray versus, uh, uh, sorry, Fernabache versus Barcelona. You know, Pal was my boss, we call him Pal. He's the same gentleman that I mentioned, this is the first person I gave him this idea about. So I said, it was him, he switched off the light for this game. And I heard he lost heavily. So Dan Tan said, no, it was me who switched off the light. It was not Pal, me and one more Chinese guy. So, and they used the generator to start the game. So then he was the one who shed light that the original person who switched off the light was the idea was given by Pile, one gentleman called Pile, who happens to be my friend as well and also the, uh, 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 a good friend of Paolo. So the idea went to a bigger man who executed this in England. Why have you used Asian bookmakers for placing bets on fixed matches? Yes, Asian betting, because European gambling system is completely different from ours. No? Because uh, our betting websites can absorb 
uh, 100 to 120,000 euro on a single match of, of depending on what caliber. Uh, if you're talking about uh, Spanish, German or, or Italian in EPL, uh, then the volume is a lot more bigger, 200,000 in, in just uh, two, two clicks away. That's about 120,000 euro. So, and like Dutch football and so on, I think uh, you can easily place a bet within up to uh, uh, 200,000 as well, maybe another two more clicks, you know. So the volume is quite big for all these uh, top leagues. Why will be the World Cup 2022 uh, held in Qatar? I think uh, anybody with the right frame of mind will not play the World Cup in Qatar in 2022. Is it 2022? Yeah. Uh -huh. Because the weather there, okay, the heat is unbearable. I mean, you can have an Akon Stadium, but you cannot have an Akon City, can you? I mean, it doesn't make sense. You cannot walk with, with the, you practically have to be bare body, you know, to, because the heat is so, so, so terrible. I think uh, those who voted to play uh, the match under these circumstances, uh, uh, weather conditions, you must be out of your mind. So the only thing that uh, you can deduce is that corruption must have taken place, although it cannot be proven. But when you actually play the tournament in 2022, then you will get a better picture. Because now everybody is saying it's hot, it's this and that, no alcohol, no this and that. But after the aftermath will be a, a better uh, situation for us to digest and to talk how what actually happened. Earlier you stated that it's you who brought Nigeria and Honduras to World Cup 2010. The interesting one is that Nigeria was playing Kenya in Nairobi, in Kenya. And, uh, and Nigerians were as good as they had a very, very slim chance, outside chance of qualifying. So uh, Tunisia was playing Mozambique at that time. So. I was in Nigeria and uh, I was uh, sitting and uh, discussing this with one of a top guy. Uh, he was not the president, he was a top guy. So after listening to me, then he went back to the president, he met the president and the top guy. So I told them, look, I will do my level best to assist you. So which means that I'll get the uh, re uh, assistance of the referee to help you. And uh, of course, the referee himself, when I spoke to him, his heart was in favor of Nigeria to win the match. He said, I think Nigeria should win the match. So uh, there was some discussion between me, the referee and the president, but not all together, but different. So in return, I said, Nigeria, if you qualify, okay? I, I told them the plan that, look, I will assist Nigeria to win this match. I have some players in Kenya, and then we'll get the referee to assist us. So you're gonna get your three points. That is no question. But now let's move to Tunisia. All Tunisia needs is a draw to qualify for the World Cup. So the best I can do here is get the Mozambique boys to fight for the game and try to win the game. So I sent a letter using my company that there will be a 100,000 reward for Mozambique if they beat Tunisia. And the letter did go to Mozambique Football Association. I don't know if FIFA's investigation revealed that or not. So <clears throat> eventually, Mozambique beat Tunisia and Nigeria beat Kenya. And that's how Nigeria qualified for the final. And they were supposed to give me three friendly matches and I was supposed to organize their warm-up matches and their camp. And even then, I told him that FIFA usually gives you one million. So I draw up a quotation for one million but in actual fact, it will be around 300,000 for this uh, 700,000. There's a leftover of 300,000 and it will be in your pocket. That's what I told the president. But after they qualify, they completely ignored me. Maybe because I had uh, a three weeks uh, psychological, uh, um, psychology evaluation because of my recent case in Singapore in 2009. So I was sent for psychiatric evaluation in prison for three weeks and I lost this contact with the, with the Nigerian guys. Were there fixed matches at World Cup 2010 in South Africa? In the World Cup itself, the only fixed match that I can come up with is uh, North Korea versus Portugal, 7-0. 
I think uh, you, you don't play for a 2-1 result with Brazil, the first match, and you lose 7-0 to uh, Portugal. 7-0 is a precise score that you can maximize your winnings. So as you can see, sometimes uh, you see like a Red Bull Salzburg. They went to Tottenham Hotspur and they lose 7-0. Or if I'm not wrong with the score, 6-0, 7-0. This is a score line that can maximize your profit. You know, Because there's up five, up seven, uh, and you, you can use the handicap, you can use the total goals, and, and there's many patterns to, to bet on when you have a 7-0 result. How could it happen? Someone came to Korean players and offered money for a heavy defeat? I think, I think uh, when you are involved in the World Cup, you are a prominent figure. You don't approach players like... Uh, you are, of course, in the gambling field, okay, in the gambling business, and uh, you are a high flyer, which means that you... Uh, if you're paying off this North Korean to lose 7-0, you must at least pay them 3 million US dollars, which means that you must have the capacity to bet up to 15 to 20 or even 30 or 50 million dollars. You know? And then you need a, a massive network for you to place the bets. So there's a lot of questions. How have you come to Finland in 2011, where you eventually got arrested? Why have you chosen precisely this country? Actually, it was uh, my New Year. It was uh, Diwali. It was in 2009. So one of my friends said he has got link with uh, someone uh, from uh, Zambia, a player who was playing in this uh, uh, Finnish first league. So, but the team, uh, that that match when I arrived was the last match. So whenever it's the last match, the bookmakers may not open the odds because there's a lot of teams that may give away three points and also bookmakers cannot kind of adjust what odds to set. So they don't usually open. So nevertheless, we went there to try out whether it opens or it doesn't open. So when the boys came to see me, I gave them 10,000 each and I said, look, the, the odds may open, may not open, but even if it doesn't open, we work together next year. So that is how it all started. And then there was no odds. So we went back home. As far as I know, your first international fixed match was Zimbabwe Bosnia Herzegovina. The first very successful uh, uh, job that was to work with Zimbabwe in the Madeka Cup. That was, we, ha we had the entire team and it was very easy to get the job done. Before, before the Madeka Cup, I also worked with um, a Zimbabwe team in the in the Merdeka Cup in Malaysia. That was in 1996 or 7, I'm not too sure. That was a very hilarious thing happened and so on. You know, they were supposed to lose to Bosnia, Bosnia Herzegovina. At that time, there was, I think, um, there was this war going on in Serb Serb Serbia. So Malaysia is a Muslim country. They supported Bosnia quite a bit, and they invited Bosnia to come and play. So Zimbabwe was playing Bosnia, and and the Bosnians were the favourites. Was it the Bosnians? Yes, the Bosnians were the favourites. But this team was a more like a patch-up team from Bosnia. The, in fact, when the game started, and we were fixing this game for Bosnia to win by 4-0, or at least 2-0. By what happened, the result ended in a draw. Because one of our players was basically the Bosnian team was way below standard. And the Zimbabwean, even if they want to concede, they had trouble doing so. We had five players. One of the players just volley from the middle of the field when the score was 1-0 in favour of Bosnia. And the ball ended up in the net. And what he did was, he put his head, uh, put both his hands on the head and, oh my God, why did I score? And then all the, the boys that we spoke made a scrum like a rugby players and started discussing what are we going to do now. But eventually, the result, we lost the result. Then we repaired the damage during the semi-final with China. So we got the result we wanted, we paid the boys off, you know, everything was good. Wilson Rajpi Rumal loved bookmakers but hated to lose. This trick made him one of leading match fixes around the globe and this put an end to his empire. He brought African national teams to Asian tournaments and instructed how many goals must they concede. Between the games, he brought the representatives of the teams to nightclubs. He proposed to turn off floodlights in English Premier League to win bets. He financed one Finnish club to secure the needed result every weekend. I'm sure this happens every day in every part of the earth. We're just lucky to learn about several frauds thanks to Perumal.
But this doesn't matter, as you always have a chance to win money on bets. Just don't place them on Asian leagues. The rest is secured by marathon bets. What about Zenit Dynamo Minsk? First leg was won by Dynamo 4-0, in the second one they were beaten 8-1. You know, when it comes to Eastern European football matches, there's a big question mark on the, on the integrity of the results, you know, especially Eastern European. So, I, I, I didn't follow this match, but it looks completely dubious. What is UEFA as an organization today? I cannot exactly say who is handling it, because I, I lost touch with all this, who, who is running the FIFA, who is running UEFA and so on. But I think uh, uh, the early 2010 to 2015, uh, money played a big role. You know? So you, you can see that Platini was supposed to be the president of FIFA, but uh, uh, it didn't go well, and uh, and uh, you have so many people in the organization being corrupt. You know, it's very embarrassing for football. And even now, the, uh, I think there is some issues with the, the FIFA president also. What did you do in Syria? As far as I know, you were working in their league. I was in Syria because I met one player from the Syrian national team, and he he had access to a lot of other players. And uh, when we went to Syria. Uh, it was very easy to fix the matches, you know, because Syria was in local championship. Yes, yes, very underdeveloped as well. So there was, I was there in one winter, and, and this guy is a national football player, and he had barely any heater in his house, only a small stand where I had to just stay very close to that heater. So, uh, and uh, my offer was a very good offer for them: ten thousand U.S. dollars per player per match. I had about six or seven players in one team. So I paid them 70,000 US dollars and it was very good money for them. And my agent was telling me, why are you paying them 10,000? You can just pay them 3,000. I said, no, I can bet and take what I need from there. So give them what they deserve. So, uh, and, and the results were so easy, you know, so easy. Until two, two of my friends, who, who realized that I was making good money in Syria, they decided to uh, try out in Syria and they got caught by the police and they ended up in prison. And then the whole Syrian business went Stop. kaput. Stop. Yes. Because it was already in the media, in the press, that these guys are fixing matches and the results are always 2 1, 2 1, 2 1. What about the American stage of your career? In 1996, you went to work at Olympic Games in Atlanta. What teams have you been working yeah, with? Uh, Atlanta Olympics, we went there and then we, we, we worked with, um, I think, uh, a Tunisian team. A Tunisian team. And that was the only team we, we worked with. I tried. You, you had closer connect with Manchester? Uh, I never had this connection. It was like we went there to approach. And before I could approach, already Paul's uh, friend called Frankie, his name is Frankie, he already approached the Tunisians and the Tunisians were very ready and I think they did a good job against Portugal 2-0 and then they lost to US 3-1 but very strange against, uh, I think if it's not wrong with Argentina, the match was not fixed but the game ended in a draw, for what reason they didn't fix the matches I am not too sure because I, I was just a, a runner to help around at the time, I was too young maybe uh, Early, uh, early 20s. You have fixed the game Togo Australia. Please tell about that match. You're talking about the abandoned game Togo Australia, the youth game. Yes. Uh, okay, we had to abandon the game because uh, um, one of the bosses who was supposed to do the game pulled out. So I had to prove this guy he was wrong because he was thinking that we were selling this information to another group of people. You know, you, if you are in the match fixing, you only work with one boss, you don't work with two bosses. When the two of them start betting, then the odds will crash. So it defeats the purpose of going to two people, you end up getting nothing. So the bottom line is, uh, uh, I wanted to prove him wrong. So I asked the Togolese boys to 
give their 100% effort to fight. And the first half was already 1-0. So if the game ends, then I lose my money. So I had to do something to come up, to abandon the game. So discuss with the coach, we had a discussion with the coach and then the coach said, okay, let me replace three players. Uh, and then uh, there was already, we already had two red cards and two of them injured. We got two of them injured, so with six people, you cannot continue the match. The game was abandoned, so we had our money refunded back. So it, that was that was something unique that we did on that particular match. Once a newspaper published the result of Malaysian Cup fixture one day before the kick-off, which resulted in arrests, what was the story? Well, match fixing had always existed in Singapore, even before, maybe before I was born or anything like that. And then the, <clears throat> it was already rife and rampant match fixing, but there was no law to curb match fixing at that time. So people had license to do whatever they want to do, until there was a, 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 a like what you just mentioned that the newspaper could pro provide the result of the match before the match was kicked off. So somebody had to take some kind of action. So it went to the Corrupt Practice Investigation Bureau of Singapore. They arrested quite a number of people, then in Malaysia as well, and eventually the whole tournament was called off. Singapore pulled out from the Merdeka tournament, uh, the Malaysia Cup. Italian Serie A is another hot topic. As far as I know, there were also several fixed matches I, there. I, I, I was not uh, directly involved in this, but my, my, my partner was involved in some Italian match-fixing connection. And uh, there were two matches that he gave me a share of 100,000. Uh, and that's all I know. And I, I was quite surprised that uh, they could fix uh, Italian A-League games. But uh, what I was told that uh, we were not fixing. Our guys or our group or my friends were not fixing. The Italians were fixing and they came to us to bet, which means that they wanted about 1 million euro uh, betting amount for this particular match but the fixing was put done by the Italians we just assist them with the betting you know but of course we we ride on their information when they know that uh, we could bet easily two million on that match or even three million but they only wanted one million so we have another free pie uh, or, or we have a free volume of two million to what degree I, I believe that you can accomplish your result so after the first match, second match, third match, if you are a good fixer, then we will follow you a much bigger amount. So that was how we got involved in the Italian league. How were you arrested in Finland? Oh, okay, like I said, the, 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 <laughs> the whole thing was so strange that uh, um, I never knew that uh, someone had come from Singapore to file a complaint in this city that uh, they have seen a Singaporean wanted man. I, I had no idea. And uh, how I was arrested is because we have finished the game, uh, which did not go well, and uh, did not go favorable. So next day, 6 a.m., we were flying out from Rovaniemi to Helsinki. So when we arrived in Helsinki, uh, when all the passengers were uh, boarding, I mean, uh, were, were, were stepping out from the plane, um, I was the last person, and there was someone who was checking everybody's passport. So she stopped me. And then I realized something was not right. But the passport I was carrying was not my name, but had my picture on it. So, but it was from the Immigration Department of Singapore. So it was an original passport. So the only way you can detect that I'm not the person is by using my fingerprint because it's a biometric passport. So what happened that uh, I didn't know that the Rubanemi police had a, a concrete evidence that I am Wilson Raj and I'm not the person they had because there was a complaint. At that point of time when I was being stopped, I don't know. So I was cracking my head, why would somebody want to stop a domestic flight and check who's the passenger? And then she stops me. So something is not right. But the only hope I had was that my passport is original and I am not Wilson Raj on that passport. And it's an original passport when you put through these uh, immigration uh, whatever machine you have. So when they came back, this police officer had a picture of me and he was looking at me. He said, it's not this person, but actually it was me. He was trying to look and locate a cut here, but he couldn't locate the cut. 
No? So he said this. So he called back the Ruvanami, he said, this is not the person. You got the wrong person. But the Ruvanami police had more concrete evidence. They said, put him on the next flight, send him back to Ruvanami. So when I went there, then the fingerprints and all, so I am Wilson Raj. So I got arrested and then it was only for immigration purpose. You know? But somehow, I don't know, somehow, the National Bureau of Investigation went, took another step and then the telephone records with the players and all, so everything was extracted and then the players got arrested. And these are not criminal people who have never spent a single day in prison before, so they're not strong, so they broke. You know? so when they break, there's nothing for me to, to, to hold back. You know? so okay, we were all together. Wilson Raj Perumal lives a life rich in ups and downs, whose biography is a nice scenario for a blockbuster. It's up to you how to treat such business. Wilson told his story in the interview, and we tried to clear out his motivation to fix football games. I won't express my personal opinion of this person, but I got a feeling that today I touched a significant part of world football's history.